very good morning to all of you uh, today uh, actually uh, our council member one of the council members of the ksm very active council member dr vajira r jasing will be delivering the lecture cme lecture he is a graduate from peradeniya from 1998 Uh, in in 1998, uh, and he graduated with MS surgery as a postgraduate from Colombo, and he obtained his MRCS from Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh, and uh, serves more than 10 years in Sri Lanka as a uh, consultant surgeon with a special interest on in GI and colorectal surgery as well as wound care. So he is uh, elaborating on wound care today, and his topic will be walk with wounds. So I invite Dr. Vajra Jayasinghe to proceed with this lecture. Uh, good morning, the President and the Council members of KSM and my dear colleagues. Uh, first of all, I thank the Kandy Society of Medicine to pay me this opportunity to talk about this uh, dilemma to the doctors. Actually, wound is a dilemma because uh, nobody loves wounds. Uh, we may like to see the acute wounds, but not the chronic wounds. It's, it's actually really a dilemma. Uh, so we'll uh, see how does uh, the wound to be a uh, deal with. That wound, wound is a uh, it's a break in the skin. The skin is the largest organ in our body, which gives us the protection from the external environment, and it can be breached by we all know physical, mechanical, or thermal damage. And interestingly, as a result of some underlying medical or physiological disorders. Right. So these are the uh, common things. Uh, the mechanical damage we all know there are abrasions, grazes, and interestingly, what we made as surgeons or doctors, the wounds which we made, and sometimes by somebody else, with bullet or gunshot or penetrating injuries, and by animals. Physical damages we all know that it's a pressure ulcers. It's a very common thing, and thermal damage nothing much to talk about with the uh, medical personnel. So medical or physiological disorders, uh, arterial and venous ulcers, we all are very familiar with. But in addition to that, there are some autoimmune diseases which causes uh, ulcers and endocrine and dermatological conditions, hematological disorders as well, and some wounds associated with some systemic infections. And uh, malignancies also can present like ulcer, and also the neuropathic ones. So these are the uh, common causes and classification. So let me see how is the epidemiology is. Pressure ulcers, they are common, and they occur usually in 9% of hospitalized patients. Uh, so usually during the first couple of weeks in the hospi of hospitalization, and uh, nearly 3% of ICU patients, because ICU care is much more better than the ward care, so it is less. The annual risk of pressure ulceration of patients with neurologic impairment is 5 to 8 percent, and uh, lifetime risk is very high, and mortal rate is nearly 80 percent. percent. So venous ulcers make nearly 70 percent of chronic lower extremity ulcers. And the next dilemma is the diabetic foot lesions. At least 15% of diabetics will develop a foot ulcer in their life. And sadly, one day to one fourth, these ulcers will require amputation. Right. Let's replace our memory on the uh, anatomy of the skin. I run through the slides which we uh, used, and uh, there's a uh, the definition for wound, and then the uh, common causes and uh, classification of that, the mechanical damage, physical damage ones, thermal damage ones, and the medical and physiological disorders, and then the epidemiology, which 
we were talking about the pressure ulcers it's nearly 9% of all hospitalized patients and less in ICU patients and annual risk of pressure ulcer is 5 to 8% with patients with neurologic impairment and venous ulcers are the commonest which we told and uh, then the diabetic foot lesions which is a problem and it's 15% of diabetics will develop a low extremity ulcer and uh, nearly 12 to 24 percent, that's one fourth to one eighth, uh, will need an uh, amputation at some stage. And uh, we'll refresh our mem uh, memory on uh, anatomy of skin. And we all know that there's epidermis and dermis and subcutaneous tissues. And epidermis consists of three layers. And dermis is the one which has these blood vessels and nerves and skin appendages. So the with the minor abrasions, we did not bother that to remove our epidermis. Even we do with the skin grafts. So when it happens to breach up to the dermis, it's painful and bleeding. Then you also will be bothered and patients also will be bothered. Uh, so uh, at the same time, we uh, refresh our memory on uh, the pathology and physiology of the wound healing. Wound healing is a collective term for the physiological process that repair and restore the damaged skin. So what we are doing is not miracles, we just help the nature, the body's capacity to overcome this wound. Uh, and we help the body to remove the obstacles. So this healing involves the complex of release of molecular and cellular and chemical changes which we all know that inflammation followed by proliferation and granulation and then remodeling and re-epithelialization with repair. So the wound, he uh, wound and healing involves all body's response, not only the wound. Uh, so need, uh, it's useless to look only at the wound. We have to see the patient as a patient. So the individual a patient should be assessed and treated as a uh, whole patient. So this is just a flow chart to refresh your memory. The wounding which will uh, release some eicosanoids and then uh, platelet activation, it will uh, give rise to inflammatory reaction. And thereafter fibroblasts and uh, uh, lymphocytes and macrophages, they do two roles. And at last, there's a balance between the collagen synthesis and collagen lysis. And at the same time, repair goes on the other side with epithelialization. And at last, the somehow, one of these sides will win the battle. So if the healing part wins the battle, wound heals. If not, it will proceed to a chronic ulcer. So the acute wounds, acute wound, uh, it, it just heal uh, within few weeks, right? If acute wound does not heal for more than four to six weeks, and if it proceeds beyond that, then it will automatically fall into the chronic ulcer category. So the chronic wounds are generally characterized by persistent state of inflammation. So it's an inflammatory process going on, which prolongs and interrupts the healing process. And it heals by the secondary intention. And there are some wounds which are non healing wounds. When non healing wounds, the, when we don't achieve the healing process, it's become a non healing wound. There are some wounds which uh, will never heal. The etiology is easy, it didn't heal. That's the problem. If it heals, nobody bothers. Didn't heal means diabetic, infection, drugs, some drugs, nutrition, then tissue necrosis, hypoxia to the wound, uh, excessive tension to the wound, and another wound in the same region. Another wound means in the, another structure other than the uh, skin and the low temperature. These are the uh, common causes. Then there are some specific ones. 
arterial venous insufficiency, all medical persons know, and lymphedema. Sometimes some of us miss that. And neuropathic ulcers and pressure ulcers, it's common. Neoplasms, radiation also gives rise to. Uh, nowadays, uh, we see some because now our uh, oncological part is developed and there are a lot of patients who had radiation. So atheroembolism is another one and pyodoma gangrenosum, sickle cell, uh, anticoagulation, actinomycosis, and uh, some conditions like calciphylaxis and necrobiosis lipotica. These are the other etiological causes, not common, but it can be. So the factors, I mean, what factors affects the wound healing? So they generally, the general, general and physical, psychological health, right? So remember that psychological health of patient is also important in wound care. Then the, his treatments, systemic or local treatments and nutritional and hydration status, right? Hydration status is also important. The type of wound, the location of the wound, and the depth and the extension of the wound, and the damage to the deep tissues are important in wound healing. These are the factors which affect the wound healing. And then the temperature of the wound and the region of the wound. Then the moisture level and the pH balance also affects. Then the commonest thing which we all know, the colonization, infection. Then the blood supply to the wound and wound bed and surrounding area and the edema of the surrounding area. Then the disruption of their normal sleep pattern, which we usually do not think about, like the psychological aspect, the sleep pattern is also affects the wound healing. History of smoking and alcohol consumption, as for all the medical conditions for the wound also, it is very important. So medications such as steroids, we all know, and immunosuppressants also, uh, affects the wound healing. Then the environmental factors. So what should we do when a wound patient with a wound comes? Mm -hmm. Beyond looking at the wound only, you have to look at the patient as we discussed before. So there should be a good thorough patient assessment, right? It's a holistic patient assessment which should include the physiological, psychological, and social aspect, not only the medical side of the wound. Physiological, psychological, and the social aspect of this patient as a well. whole. So the wound, etiology of this wound should be established by thorough examination and after a good history and everything. We have to establish an etiology for this wound. Otherwise, we are lost. We don't know what to do with this wound. Then, when planning care, the clinician must take into account the patient's circumstances and wishes and the overall goals of the treatment. And patients should have a good wish. I have one patient. He drops into the ward time to time. Whenever we try to do something good for the wound, this patient vanishes. So it's a hinganagi tuvali. The patient's intention is also very important. Now we know that he comes to get something from the hospital and run away. So no point trying with all the assets we have in that type of patient. Right. So the patient's goal and family's affordability and their environment, social security, everything is important in this wound care. Uh, because I met some patients, they have chronic wound, wounds. Some with great efforts, we will be able to achieve some kind of healing. But the problem is that patients' access to the medical facilities and patients' affordability and families' other commitments and problems. So then we have to take another decision. Uh, the following information should be documented in the initial assessment. So it's not just uh, writing a prescription and send the patient away. They should have a, it's a chronic problem, like 
hypertension, diabetes, and ischemic heart disease patient. We all have to have a good record with this patient. That only helps us and the patient to overcome this chronic problem. Right? So the medical history, nutritional assessment, psychological and social assessment, this is the most important part which we forget most of the time. And wound assessment. Otherwise, we will put this patient into a deep trouble, the family and the patient, with this wound. Rather than the wound, they will face other problems. Right. In the medical history, the it's very familiar for us. Past history and current medical conditions and his general health, drug and current prescribed treatment, and uh, the any alternative therapies he had smoking and alcohol history, allergies, nutritional and hydration level, and his BMI, his mobility. Mobility is also very important. And the temperature and pulse and blood pressure of the affected area. And he'll have a good blood, uh, blood pressure and good capillary bleeding in his hand, but the leg, it won't be. So we have to look at the region as well. The previous and planned investigations, everything, his previous ones, planned ones, new ones, we have to uh, see these things. This is medical history. And the nutritional assessment, it's very important because we all know that for healing, proteins and vitamin C, zinc, these things are very important with wound healing. So all patients should have a nutritional screening. Malnourished or at risk patient should be managed accordingly. And nutrition compromised patients should be given a nutritional support with a nutritionist or a dietitian's help. Right? Now we have a good nutritional support because now doctors are involving with this thing with a sound knowledge of nutrition. So it's available, not like before. So we have to get their help to restore their nutritional level. And patient's weight, height, and BMI should be recorded at the initial assessment. So then the psychological and social assessment, this is the most important part. A patient is under stress, is depressed, like uh, malignancy, right? So this is a big problem for him. His social life and day-to-day -day life, everything is affected. So uh, then we have to see the ability of sleeping, right? Then the ability of understand the cause of wound and ability to participate in care is the another important part. If patient don't understand what is there and what is etiology, so he'll be a headache for you, the doctor, right? So that's why I told that sometimes it's a dilemma to the doctor because patient do not understand the things then he'll come behind you begging some things. Uh, the factors that may affect the accordance with treatment, sometimes dementia, lack of mental capacity, and will, uh, some learning difficulties. These are the problems we have associated with the management of chronic wounds. Pathetically, a lot of patients with chronic wounds will have a lot of social problems. Their affordability is very low. These are the common problems in our country when we manage the wounds. So then the drug and alcohol dependency in the occupation, family structure, and the care who, to be, uh, who is going to look after this patient. So these are very, very important. I uh, highlighted that because those parts we usually uh, forget when we see a patient and treat a uh, patient with a chronic wound. This, consider this as a, like a, looking after a malignant patient. So the, then the details, detailed attitudes and the, any avoidance of social activities due to this general condition and the wound. Then the wound assessment, these things should be documented in our assessment. We have to have an assessment record, the record we have to, uh, document clearly the date and time of assessment, type of wound, and the underlying possible etiology. The factors which we identified which could delay this healing, and the location of the wound, map, 
then the duration then wound measurements wound measurements should be done at least once in four weeks right uh, the usually what we do is we have to take the length and the width and take as a square that's how we measure the wound the healing also we have to measure and record that width and the length of the wound so then we can have an idea whether this wound is healing or not then the type and color of tissues and wound bed the in presence of infection uh, odor exudate pain wound margins how the dressing look like and everything then this wound should be reassessed in a proper way not to just to peep into the wound we have to record everything at least in four weeks intervals so the investigations what how do we proceed with this patient so should not jump to do the all the investigations under the sun we have to look for the possible cause and we have to target those investigations towards that so the laboratory studies test full blood count basic uh, metabolic profile like renal and uh, liver assessment electrolytes because chronic disease can affect this wound healing like renal failure liver dysfunction cardiac failure respiratory problems everything affects so then the determination of serum protein albumin and pre-albumin transferrin levels we all know that hemoglobin level protein levels everything affects then the coagulation studies and the tissue cultures of the wound imaging right if we really need imaging we have passed it can be ranged from the plain radiography to ct to mri or a vascular ultrasonography to the vascular mapping or angiogram sometimes a bone scan we may need to exclude osteomyelitis and then we have to perform a biopsy for the suspicious wounds and uh, then the vascular lab investigations the, there's a medical management for this wound and we all think it's a surgical part no combined thing it's also a multidisciplinary approach as we talk about before uh, it's a multidisciplinary approach psychological aspect nutritional aspect right medical problems everything be sorted out you know simultaneous man so the assessment of patient nutritional assessment ensure adequate oxygenation we have to uh, replace the good volume replacement hypothermia should be corrected and sympathetic vasoconstriction if it is there we have we have uh, we have to address those things and then we have to ensure the adequate nutrition and we have to treat the infection and irrigate the wound and keep the wound clean and provide a moist wound bed this is the most important part so what to do with a if patient comes with a chronic wound we have to identify and treat the cause and on the other hand we have to identify the patient's social circumstances and it's a family centered concerns then we have to determine the ability to heal this wound there are some wounds with healable. There are some wounds we can maintain, right? The other category is non-healing wounds. So we have to discuss with the patient and we have to tell the family, this is the plan. This wound is going to heal. This wound, chances of healing are there, but we have to spend this much, so we'll go ahead with the healthy wound and the next category is non-healing wound can't help right but still you can live with this wound so then the local wound care according to the wound and the decision we have to go ahead so the healable wounds adequate blood supply to heal and treat the cause so we have identified the cause and it is treatable so it's healable wound maintenance wound mostly it's a uh, either the patient cannot or will not adhere to the plan of care or healthcare system do not have the facility to 
uh, associate with this wound. So then can't help. There are options, but it's not available. So nearly 25% of the wounds are like this. Right? So we have to go ahead with the healthy wound and a good lifestyle. Then non-healing wounds. Nearly 5 to 10% are like that in that category. Uh, mostly due to inadequate blood supply to that part, which cannot be restored. Or cause that cannot be correct, right? Uh, something like terminal cancer and chronic malnutrition, which cannot be corrected with a negative protein balance. These things are there. So this is how we assess the wound into three categories. So the next thing is wound dressing. We are not fascinated with the wound dressings, but we have to know how the wound dressings are, right? Because a lot of people will come to you and introduce thousands type of wound dressings. This is the best, right? It is for, so we have to know what is the best for my patient. So uh, we will see the following characteristics should be considered when choosing the dress, wound dressing. Right? So there's a not the best wound dressing. There are better wound dressings for some wounds. So wound dressing should have the ability to prevent penetration of capillary loops because there's a healing process going on. And if capillary loops penetrate into our dressing, next time we will hurt the wound and a lot of bleeding, right? So it should be hypoallergic. Otherwise, there's another problem. On top of the wound, there's an allergic condition as well. So hypoallergenic, wound dressing should be there, should be sterile and have a long shelf life. If the wound dressing shelf life is shorter, be difficult to afford that. Right? It should be cost effective. This is the most concerned part in our population. Right? Even 1000 rupees is a big money for a lot of people. So most of the wound dressings are expensive. Something more than 1005, ranging from 1005 to 4,500, which is for about four to five days. So imagine for a month and then for a long term, how does this patient going to afford? Cost effectiveness and have an evidence based one, right? Not the, should be a, at least level two, right? Not the level four one. And, uh, because uh, some people will tell that person is using heat, all this is good. Right? So it's a uh, very lower level evidence. Maintenance high, maintain the high humidity of the wound and optimum pH and wound dressing at, at the wound and the uh, dressing interface. Then it should be able to remove excessive exudate and the toxic components which is formed in the wound bed and it should not release toxic chemicals to the wound uh, or particles or fibers then other it will act, act as a toxin or a foreign body to the wound right so this wound dressing should allow good gases exchange right? and it should provide a good thermal insulation and it should be impermeable to bacteria and the free from particulate or toxic contaminants and it should uh, it should allow removal without causing additional trauma to a wound otherwise we will renew this wound like renewing the library card so it should be comfortable to wear and ensure the wound remains moist with the date but not macerate right then the surrounding skin also get into trouble So after the debridement, apply a moist saline dressing because wound need a moist wound bed. Isotonic sodium chloride gel is the best, right? There are some things which uh, are familiar with the names, so that's why I include those things. Uh, not to promote anybody, but you to get familiarized what type of thing is this, the sodium, sodium chloride gel. In hydroactive paste, right? The optimal wound coverage requires wet to damp dressing. And 
which support autolytic deprimer, absorb exudate, and protect surrounding normal skin. So there are some polyvinyl film dressings, like we all know that Tegaderm oxide, they are the commonly available ones, which is it is semi-permeable to and oxygen and moisture, but it's resistant to the bacteria. We can see the wound through this dressing. For, for dry dressing, dry wounds, hydrochloric gel dressings are the best. So uh, they are impermeable to oxygen, moisture, uh, and bacteria. So they will keep the wound bed moist, moisturized because it's not yet evaporated. And then they maintain the moist environment and they support the autolytic debris. So they are good for this type of little bit dry wounds. But a wound like this is it not suitable. So the hydrogels are mostly made up of uh, carboxymethyl cellulose. And uh, the hydrogels, the tegaderm, they bring these hydrogels. And they are available in forms of sheets and amorphous gels. Hydrogels should not be used on moderate to highly exudating wounds. Should be a, for a wound like for oxidative wounds, absorptive dressings, right? Like alginates and hydrofiber dressings are better. So they are available in rope forms, which is useful for packing the wound. This wound is deep, so and pack them. This type of exudative wound, we have to do a debriment first, and then impregnated ghost dressing, such as uh, right, may salt, and these are useful, but we have to change them frequently. They are costly, they, we need them frequently. These are the problems. Right. Sorry. For infected wounds, silver, silver dressings are better, right? I don't say it's the best, but they are better. So there are silver mesh dressings and uh, several things. They are better for these infected wounds. So just to have a summary, alginate dressings, they are highly absorbent and useful for wounds with copious exudate, alginate. Hydrofiber dressings, useful in exudative wounds, like we saw before. And debriding agents, we all use some papo, and uh, this aloe vera, bee honey, these things. So these are, by experience, uh, a lot of us know what happens with these things to the wood. So the, the they are not accepted ones, but the papain urea is used with some dressings. So they are debriding agents. They are useful for the necrotic wounds, as for as a uh, adjunct therapy for our surgical debris. Then the form dressings. Form dressings are useful in cleaning the granulating wounds with minimal exudate, not a wound like a lot of exudates. So the hydrocolloid dressings, gels, right? They are useful for dry necrotic wounds and hydrogel are useful for sloughy and necrotic wounds. Then the low adhesive dressings, right? Like uh, tegaderm pad. They are useful in the minor wounds, minor cuts and skin tears and small wounds. Because transparent films, right? They are useful for the clean wounds, like for the surgical scar. So then uh, there are some other options, right? So the topical agents like platelet derived growth factor, uh, some uh, people are using and uh, still some publications are coming. So it, it, it's a, a newly growing area. Right? So we have to update our knowledge with this therapy is uh, to what kind of wounds we should use. Right? It's not a sole treatment. So then the enzyme collagenase, right? Uh, they are also uh, used and still under a lot of studies. And uh, the topical agents like sugar and tacit, vitamin A and D O in one, bee honey, a uh, lot of things are being used. However, 
we have to avoid cytotoxic agents, right? Like hydrogen peroxide. It's, it's so funny to see, right? Because uh, the lot of bubbling comes and people, patient also will be very happy, but we burn the wound bed with this, right? The next time, if you happen to use some hydrogen peroxide with something, just poke your finger in and see how much of temperature is generated in that teeth. So the povidone iodine is also toxic to the granulation tissue, healthy tissues, right? Acetic acid, right? vinegar. In, in some conditions, we use it as a, in the alternative dressing pathway for a short duration. It's not for a wound dressing to keep it. So, and then the sodium hypochlorite solution. So these things are being used, but they are toxic to the granulation tissue. So we have to avoid these things. Then the compression therapy, right? We have to first see what is the etiology and does this patient really need the compression therapy? Compression is appropriate for ulcers caused by, exacerbated by extremity edema, right? And the compression may have to be avoided entirely in what type of patients with a arterial insufficiency. So before applying compression, we must confirm that there is no arterial insufficiency, right? Otherwise, we will put this patient into a trouble, deep trouble. Kabbalim limit. So approximately 40 to 60 millimeter mercury of pressure is uh, in the absence of arterial disease, absence of arterial disease. And 20 to 30 in the presence of suspicion of mild arterial insufficiency. So we do not measure this pressure, right? For the juniors especially, it is what I, we have seen in the practice. Sometimes people will apply with the Enormous pressure, right? Take a uh, this uh, compression bandage or a elastoplaster, and then pull with their all the powers in the hand to wrap the leg. Right? I have very bad experience one day. Uh, one patient, I'm not going to tell which hospital. Uh, after having a compression bandage for a venous ulcer, in three days' time, patient came with a pain in the leg. When I saw whole leg was ganglion, right? neck cross. We have to remove the leg. So we have to have a sound idea about the pressure generated by this compression. Right? So pressure ulcers. When we see that these are not the venous ulcers, these are pressure ulcers in a, and, uh, immobilized patients usually we see, right? So it's, if it is non-blanchable erythema in the intact skin, the pink color one, pinky skin, so this type of dressing, which we can see through, right? And uh, next one is partial thickness skin loss involved in the epidermis and the dermis. So skin is lost. The cracking and blistering is there and shallow crater, and it looks like abrasions. And if we have to, Clean it with saline and keep it as a clean wound. So full thickness ones with the subcutaneous fatty tissues are exposed. So all the skin is gone. It's a distinct ulcer with margins and deep crater. And you will see a off color fat tissue with this. And we say it's a pressure ulcer. So we have to do a debridement for that. And we have to irrigate it thoroughly and apply a appropriate dressing. Then the full thickness skin and loss of extensive tissue involvement. Sometimes we see these type of wounds. Then they need an extensive debris. So pressure ulcers often needs the debris, topical wound care, treatment of infections, control of chronic wound contamination, because most of the pressure ulcers comes in the buttock area and these areas usually get contaminated. So positioning, and useful support of the uh, support of surface. We have to use that. So venous ulcers treatment 
includes the compression therapy, just to uh, know about these things. The providing moist wound environment, because these are special care. And everyone on necrotic tissue should be done. For the healthy ulcers, we can go ahead with the compression. In some cases, compression is inadequate and surgical vein stripping and ligation should be done. And there are compression bandages for the venous ulcers. Single layer, we all know that three layer, four layer, this and that. So we have to have a good idea, what is this? So single layer, there are formed ones, but they are expensive. So we have to find the uh, available type of compression bandages uh, as alternative for these things. Single layer ones, uh, they are uh, single layer tubular woven nylon elastic bandage. Then the three layer one. Three layer one, I put out a picture for you all to see the padding absorbent layer and compression bandage layer and cohesive compression bandage. So this is how it looks like. And this is the commonest four layer. Four layer is non wound wound contact layer. It should be permeable to the wound next to day and four overlying bandages, uh, several types. The proper board, they have a brand. I check the price in there. To be delivered to Sri Lanka, it's more than 8,000 rupees. <laughs> so this is it. So this is how it is. So impregnated wrap, next one is, there are special ones. So uh, just to know these type of things are available. So the diabetic foot ulcers is the other dilemma and we have to deal with the care. Right? Good uh, concern on this wound. So appropriate therapeutic footwear should be there. Now luckily it is available in Sri Lanka now for the cheaper price. And uh, appropriate therapeutic footwear is that. We have to educate our patient about those things, how to do the foot care and the foot wear. Right? So daily saline and similar dressings to provide moist wound environment should be daily. Deployment when necessary. Right? We have to advise them very carefully. Thorough look at the wound and in any signs of trouble. Rush for a care, run and get the care. Right? Otherwise, it's uh, keeping a bomb in the foot. It, some, in some cases, the hours matters. Right? So, the deprivation when necessary. Antibiotic therapy, if osteomyelitis is present, and better get some expert opinion in these type of wounds because uh, patient and you all will be in trouble. If with a small thing which is done wrong. So optimal control of blood sugar and the, that all we all know and evaluation and co correction of peripheral arterial insufficiency because it's common in diabetic patients, right? So the surgical therapies are there, skin graft for a suitable ones, then cadaveric aloe graft, then there are bioengineered skin substitutes, and a cellular collagen matrix is there and ultimately the flaps. So they, these are the emerging trends to know hyperbaric oxygen and adjunct to surgical wound deprivation, remove excess fluid from the wound. It's a negative pressure wound therapy. It's also expensive to have a device. We have to, a patient has to pay about some 25 to 30,000 rupees a day, it seems. That's for my knowledge. But uh, we have practiced with our available resources, apply a suction drain, which we have in the hospital. And it take time, but uh, we was successful in three patients. So biologically derived molecules for humans. And uh, uh, just few minutes before, Dr. Senaradna talked about some available nanoparticle therapy. We have to... Uh, know about those things as well. These are the new emerging trends in the wound care. Right? So the therapy director of the autologous cytokines like ADAM12 therapy and uh, angiotensin 2, these are under uh, trials. So these are the new trends along with this nanotherapy. Right? Okay, thank you.
now uh, if you have any questions thank you very much dr Madhuri Jaisinga. it's a wonderful lecture and very informative and more than that is very cool and quiet lecture beautiful can understand thank you very much dr Ajay, i have a question mm. So if a patient comes with the chronic wound, the question they ask for the emergency department probably they get the, uh, the acute wound. Uh, doctor, uh, how do you, could it be a malignancy? Yeah, uh, that's why I uh, told that, that we have to evaluate the wound thoroughly and uh, with our uh, clinical knowledge we know what are the types of malignant ulcers and how do they look like so we have to we can tell that uh, at the glance by looking at it with my experience it is this type of ulcer however we have to investigate and see what is the cause so until we come to a conclusion i can't definitely tell you somehow we are able to manage this wound so these are the things we have to do. There are a lot of things to do with the wound. So I think that gives the answer. Secondly, usually the malignant ulcers, we all learn in our medical career. It has a everted edges, rolled out with a firm base and surrounding area is a bit hard. And uh, the, there's a peculiar look for these malignant ulcers. Thank you. Do you have any questions for the audience? Okay, in the absence. Yeah. Thank you, Vajira. Thank you very much. Honestly, you're very informative. And uh, as you correctly said, it's simple and nice. Sir, sir, you can do it. Let me be here. Podium is for Vajira. <laughs> It's, it's one of the things. Uh, thank you. I think I see some medical students also here. You know, without them, all of us not very looking very good, and uh, they have come now. Uh, so it's nice. Let me see that. I have to come back to uh, One uh, I would make try to make is the cleanliness of the surrounding skin. You can clean the wound and do a protection. Just imagine a leg wound with a horrible looking skin which was never be washed for years and years, everything is dusty and the pus and the blood and the everything is fluff, everything is metal there. And so I normally get it clean. I tell them take a good shower and come or give it a good wash and come. Use soap and water, I tell them, you know, uh, baby soap. That's my word. And to make it milder. And uh, it does help because to get the skin to grow, you know, the growing skin should be very clean and nice. So, in addition, I would add up uh, that in the lecture. And uh, which, in my experience, worked uh, very well. And uh, a good Cleaning, cleaned up surrounding skin. And a uh, lot of time, you know, I clean the wood. Right. Now I'm tired and you know, I don't have time much now. So that's another one that I won't accept. Right? Then the other one is with the anatomy. You showed the anatomy of the skin. I would have gone a little deeper also to show there is blood vessel there, artery in the vein, there are nerves there, there are bones there, muscles there. So all those things can be involved. Having the medical students come, please don't look at the skin germs and epidermis only. Please see there are underneath the whole heap of structures which can be affected in the uh, wound. If you think that way, your knowledge about uh, wound will be much better. And uh, so where to take the X-ray? When to take the X-ray? You know there are big bones underneath, and you keep on cleaning it. Yes, you know that dead bone and the wound hit. And the important thing, the registrars are around the cartilage. And please teach the SHOs also. 
when you do an amputation of the toe or anything like that, for God's sake, remove that. Don't dislocate it and leave the cartilage inside. You have to get the cartilage part out. It's not the wound won't heal, right? How long? I'm sure you all have seen. And loads of time, long bleeding wounds, chronic wound comes, and you go to you know, the amputation of the hazard, and you like the hazard, and things like that. Some of the cancer are the muscle, make the muscle, you know, all sorts of things. And uh, you know, you and do the cartilage no, it eats, right? So that's another one that I would like. Uh, culture. When you want to do a culture, it, uh, fortunately, you didn't touch the antibiotic, right? And uh, that when you do culture, please take a deep culture. You clean the wound. I do whatever. I clean the wound first. Do a debris remove or whatever the, the way that I can. Then the remaining tissue, I'll take a culture. That process much better than you take a cross uh, culture from the heart and you know, drink. And that works really fun. And uh, that's what it's recommended also. The other thing is uh, when the wound is healing, especially at the joints areas, please be careful about contractions. Now, just imagine an ankle area, you have a wound and you do all sorts of things and heal the wound, and the wound is like this. Patient tries to walk after about two weeks when the wound is healing happily. She or he breaks the wound again because that won't hold. So please make some attention to your movement of the joint when you are healing the wound. MD part two candidates, please don't cite the exam site without knowing that. Tendon, exposed tendon, exposed bone. Or a body, and please don't expose it. If you remove the tendon sheet, you have done it. So, when you do wound the position and wound toilets and what for the next don't keep on scraping, super, and then you know, on the three days' time, tendons are dead. So, please be careful about very meticulous about SHOs and the registrars. Please be careful when you do wound position and give attention, a lot of attention to him. That one of the photographs uh, shown by Dr. Rajur showed uh, a tendon. That tendon is not going to survive. So you will be very careful, very meticulous. Don't uh, make it much better. So I like your words, but cobbling liquid and the dying by the the bona in our day. These are, I think, honestly, those were the things that we do also. So I hope everybody understood that single is versus also. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very informative. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for, for that kind uh, comments. Uh, I would like to uh, invite Dr. Professor Manjula Artigala to hand over a certificate of appreciation uh, to Dr. Vajira Yasin. Thank you, Dr. Vajira. Thank you very much all the participants, uh, physically as well as to the online participants.